Hey guys, so I just checked out the premiere of the first three episodes of Ruby Eyes Queendom, and I just thought I'd share my thoughts. Apologies if I look tired, I woke up at 6am today to watch the stream. And honestly, there was some pretty worthwhile content in there. Like conversation with Saori Hayami and Ami Koshimizu. To be honest, I didn't check out the last stream, but this one, Ami was a treasure. She really leaned into her character. So, then, <laughs> we got a promotional video. Which was minutes before the drop of the actual series, which is kind of odd, but okay. Also, we got two performances from Void Chords. We got the opening. My god, I do not think I've seen a sax hole like this in a long, long time. But oh no, they were not done yet because they had an insert song to play for us as well. And then after some info about merch, character designs, and well, more characters unveiled, we got to the main event. Wow, just wow was my first reaction after the premiere was done. And it really reminded me of the good times of Ruby Volume 1. Only in Ruby Volume 1, you kind of had to overlook a lot of the shortcomings and some of the clipping with the visuals because, you know, small new production company, small budget, all that jazz. But now this time. The animation. Whew, that animation was pretty clean, as expected from Shaft. Maybe I am a little biased because I usually do prefer 2D to 3D animation. The prompter loaded the word. It was on the other line. God damn it. When it went into Sakuga mode, my god did it ever. The sense of movement was incredible. I'm usually not a fan of, you know, a lot of cuts and action scenes. I usually like to see the whole thing in the wide. But if the movement's composed well in a sequence, that's all you really need. You know, a lot of movies these days make this mistake. They try to emulate, you know, the Bourne series, but they look like Taken 3 with, you know, that stupid jumping over the fence thing. Yeah, that's how you don't do that. But of course, there were a couple of things, so not really a lot of background movement, and there was some detail missing in the wider shots that I saw. I'm honestly on the fence about both these things, because honestly, the action sequences more than made up for it, and some of the detail, it could be a stylistic choice. But on the other hand, once you see what studios like Ufotable or Wit can do, then, you know, you can't really detach yourself from that's the way it should be. Before I start this, let me just say, I usually get really, really excited when an episode first airs, so these are not my final thoughts on Ice Queendom. But do hit subscribe because I am going to talk about the show in depth when the first season is done airing, which should be in September. So they did cut out like a lot of stuff, but honestly, there were a few small fine-tuned adjustments that I think really, really worked. Okay, so first of all, it is really, really nice to see Ty's relationship with his daughters, as opposed to him being a literal cardboard cutout. Ty.jpg, you live on in our hearts. As well as giving him some interaction with Ozpin, which is kind of curious because I was under the impression they were not on the best of terms in Ruby proper. Because, you know, Summer, Raven, Crow. Uh, giving Blake a little personality with this um, acceptance letter scene, that was a good move, I think, because we don't get to see too, too much of Blake in the first volume. Also, I feel like doing away with some of the comedy bits did benefit the show a lot. Honestly, a lot of the jokey anime bits in Ruby Volume 1 just didn't work for me, despite me being a huge anime fan. And of course, your mileage may vary because, you know, comedy is so, so, so subjective. An interesting note here is that the Japanese dub doesn't use the term huntsman and huntresses, instead preferring hunter, which is not a canon term, but it is used a lot in the fandom. And personally, I kind of wish it was canon because it is a lot more inclusive and a lot less clunky to say in conversation. Like, seriously. Okay, so I knew they were going to reduce everything in volume one to two to about one or two episodes, but I didn't really realize how streamlined it was going to be. But that might not entirely be a good thing. Like, we miss out on some scenes like Ruby blowing up, Ruby and Jean talking, or even the entire yellow trailer. I guess you could argue that some of these scenes aren't really necessary to the story that they're trying to tell here, but then there's the issue of pacing. I don't have the means to objectively evaluate this because I am super familiar with Ruby, but the pacing did feel a touch too fast. 
I'd wager if you weren't familiar with the show and the established relationships already, it'd feel like Juniper went from meeting to instantly trying to save one of their BFFs from the scary Nightmare Grim in the span of like, two episodes. I can hazard a guess as to why they wanted to go this route, like maybe they didn't want to bore us, the OG Ruby fans, or maybe they just wanted to get to their canon adjacent story as fast as possible. But for my part, I don't think many old school Ruby fans will tell you that they wanted less speaking interactions. It's usually quite the opposite actually. Also, I'm not sure how I feel about Weiss not taking Professor Port's conversation to heart here and instead choosing to stay more self-centered with this imaginary point system in her head. This could be because they wanted to delay this character development for the back half of the first season though, so I think we just need to wait and see. The voice acting. Okay, I've only watched the series in full in the original English, and I am aware of the Japanese dub and I do like it a lot, but I just have no reason to watch it in full. Making content around Ruby means I have to rewatch it a lot, so pardon me if I do get tired of seeing it. That said, I am a huge fan of voice actors and Seiyu in particular. I could gush over all these performances all day, but I don't have time for that. But Saudi Hayami's portrayal of Ruby Rose is incredible. She has this very unique quality to her voice where she can sound cute without raising the pitch to infinity. And of course, yes, I am excited for the English dub. Whenever it comes out, I'll be there for it. I don't know if every voice actor in the Ruby cast is actually ADR capable. This is going to be super interesting and I hope they have a behind the scenes. Because if you haven't tried it before, ADR is hard, dude. With that out of the way, let's revisit my initial theory about Weiss's split personality. Yeah, it looks like I was totally off, but fear not because where one crazy theory falls, three will spring up to take its place. It seems they're going for some kind of Snow White reference here, which is fitting because, you know, that's who Weiss is based off of after all. Weiss seems to be condemned to some kind of sleeping death by this new Nightmare Grim. And as we saw in episode 3, it looks like it's going to be on the rest of Team Ruby to bail her out. And this is where the theorizing starts to take place. Will this entire story take place inside this dream world, or will the Grim grow in power and expand into the real world? I'm leaning towards the former because it still sounds like Salem is around in this series to some extent, so I don't think she would create a world-shattering Grim. But then again, as we just saw, I could be wrong. Alright, and those are my thoughts on the first three episodes of Ruby Ice Queendom. What did you guys think? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Are you somewhere in the middle? Or do you have a theory about where the story is going? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching.